we're touching government structure. We're touching police and public safety. We're touching uh, housing with the rent control thing. This is, you can see how the Charter Commission touches a lot of bread and butter public policy issues in the city. And it's very important you should apply. This is a real, real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. Stop this. I have done plenty of time. I have nothing else going on today. We're in the Wedge neighborhood right now. 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 But uh, it's one of those tables that where the legs fold out and you have to push the pins in and then you have to raise the legs. And I thought I had done that. And then I put two glasses of water, my laptop, the microphone on top of it. And I realized, you realized way- it was upside down. I'm a tall man and this is a short table. It's not going to work. And so I, in a rush to try to be here and not be late, I, I r- raised it up while everything was set up on top of it. And I spilled a little bit of water. Oh, boy. It's mostly okay. It's it's contained. There's not going to be any water dripping into the unit below. So the ni- nice shirt. You have an Uptown themed shirt on. Yes. It doesn't say Uptown anywhere on it. It just says crime. Well, when you say crime, it, Uptown is implied. Right. There's a, probably a, going to be a, an image of my shirt on a very popular Facebook group soon. What else is going on in the news? Jacob, Jacob Fry's got a new... He's announced his intentions to implement a new no-knock policy with uh, delays, 20-second delay in the daytime, 30-second delay in the nighttime. And this is probably not uh, the the most important part of the discussion, but when I think of someone entering my home 20 seconds after knocking at any time of day, day or night, or 30 seconds a night, I'm not ready for that ever. (laughs) Well, you know... uh, I'm freaked out when I hear a knock because you're not supposed to be in my building knocking on my door. And if you knocked, I'd, it would take me a minute to decide what I need to do in that circumstance. Do I look through the people? Do I pretend it didn't happen? What do I do? Yeah, I uh, I saw a tweet that I thought made a really good point uh, that said the MPD SWAT team is going to get real good at whispering that they're the SWAT team under their breath. Right. Although there are body cams to where we can theoretically see after the fact how loudly did they shout my experience watching the tv show cops in the 1990s says that (laughs) cops shout search warrant pretty loudly sure that's when they're uh, just busting in though right yeah that's true i think that now they're going to be you know feeling some pressure to be a little quiet and you know announce many times to follow the, the letter of the the ban, but not the uh, the spirit of it. Yeah, I, and I wonder substantively, tactically, what is the difference between thirty seconds and a minute? Like, how much more evidence could you destroy? Yeah. And again, I would not be ready. It would take me a minute just to settle down from the excitement of anyone knocking on my door. Hello, Josh. Can can we give Welcome. you a hard time because you're late? Can you give me a hard time because I'm late? That's <laughs> that's my bad. Lost track of time. Did you forget that you had a, a very important podcast situation happening? I, I remembered that this was happening. I just uh, was not keeping track of the time. I looked over and was like, okay. oh, no, that's that started a few minutes ago. It's okay. I'm not really mad. I'm I'm very excited when anyone's late because I'm usually the one that's late. So I'm like, yes, it's not me. It's true. It's true. Have we officially started or are we just... We are recording because we were doing some killer anecdotes to start the show. And I'm like, we need to record this stuff. Oh, excellent. Yeah. yeah. So we, we've done all the, the jovial, you know, morning show style chit chat. So you don't, you don't have to suffer through that. <laughs> Th- this is the Wedge Live podcast. I'm your host, John Edwards. And joining me today is Jason Garcia and Josh Martin for a a charter commission themed slash recruitment drive for the many openings on the commission this year. I think there are 11 openings on this 15 member commission, which has flown under the radar for most of Minneapolis's history, 
until the last two years when it's become a surprisingly relevant body. Uh, so welcome to you both. This is going to be an exhilarating conversation, I think. Uh, judging by how enthusiastic you both are, I think you 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 agree with that statement. I used all of my uh, enthusiasm in the first take of everything. Right. Yeah. We had we did so much chit chat that Jason is winded. Yeah. It's. I'm always excited to talk about the Charter Commission. I can tell. <laughs> Maybe we'll go to Josh for the boring bullshit. Tell us what the Charter <laughs> Commission is and do it briefly because people who listen to this podcast have probably heard this too too often. What is the Charter Commission? Why do we have it? Yeah, um, so the Charter Commission is a body of 15 volunteer residents appointed by the Chief Judge of, of Hennepin County. Um, they propose amendments to the city's charter, which functions as the kind of the constitution of the city, and they review amendments proposed by the city council. And they are also uh, doing redistricting as we, well, they just wrapped up their role in redistricting recently. Correct. They have a role in redistricting, um, but that's that's done now. Um, yeah. So that won't be relevant again until the 2030 census. A surprisingly relevant organization. And, you know, I think people sometimes think of it as a panel of experts, like it, like it's a courtroom, like these are, it's apolitical. And I think the last two years have shown us that it's not apolitical. There are politics and everything, especially the Charter Commission. And the reason I bring that up is because there's lots of lawyers. It's I don't know if it's a majority lawyer body, but the most significant members of the commission are lawyers. They're kind of the leaders and people defer to them, is my sense of it, watching how the conversations go during the meetings. And uh, I, hope, I hope it's not the case that, uh, you know, putting, you know, I'm a lawyer on your your application on the Charter Commission makes you more likely to get the role. I hope we can get some more non-lawyers uh, on the Charter Commission because I think it's tilted the way, the results, the outcomes. It's it's a lot of older people, much older than the people we elect to city council, for example. It tilts more conservative than Minneapolis, which it doesn't take much to do. It's not representative, in other words. I would definitely agree with that. And, you know, when you when you bring up things like, um, you know, a, a panel of experts and things like that. It's also helpful to look at the people who are on the committee who aren't lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, um, you know, we have people who have just been sort of involved in local politics through working for neighborhood organizations, for example, and things like that. Um, and certainly that, you know, counts as some level of expertise in terms of knowing the city and things like that. But I don't think that that makes a person so qualified that, you know, any other citizen who's interested in politics and the functioning of the city government wouldn't be equally as qualified. Here's an analogy. It's kind of like a neighborhood organization, except with real, like, legal power. It's the kind of people <laughs> who show up to who have applied for the charter commission is the same kind of person. And Josh, I don't, I don't mean this as an insult. You either, Jason, I know you're VP of the wedge, <laughs> but the kind of person who applies is like the neighborhood busybody, right? That's, that's the kind of people who have applied. And the, the goal here is to make sure everyone else in the city realizes this thing exists. It's important. And you should apply. Don't be intimidated by the fact they're a bunch of lawyers. I think, you know, Listen to the, if the city attorney's office wants to give the charter commission advice and say, here's what's legal, here's what's not, take this into consideration. That's fine. That's how the city council works. That's how other political bodies work. But we don't need you necessarily to be a lawyer. It's not vital that we have lawyers on this body. In other words, any functioning, civic-minded human being can serve on this body and take the city attorney's advice and make an informed decision about uh, the constitution of the city of Minneapolis. I think that's right. Um, I think it's, I mean, as you mentioned, they do have advice from the city's attorneys. They do have um, uh, Carol Bashoon, assistant city attorney, regularly attends their meetings and can provide legal advice as needed. Um, I, I think it's important to have diversity on, on any group in, in a lot of different ways. And I, I think that certainly means in in terms of um, people's backgrounds and how we ordinarily think of diversity and having um, 
people from different backgrounds and walks of life on the commission, um, different uh, diversity in terms of uh, making sure, you know, uh, it's not all white people on the commission, um, which, uh, and I will say in that regard, they have been doing a little bit better than some other metrics. Um, I think it's important to have diversity in terms of age, um, but also it's important to have diversity in terms of uh, ideological diversity, making yes. sure that um, the Charter Commission is not in lockstep on, on the issues um, and diversity in terms of um, bringing different skill sets to the commission. I don't think we want a, a, a commission that is all lawyers, as you said, with any group, if you have all people who have all the same skill set, then they're all going to think the same way and they're all going to have the same strengths and weaknesses. Um, and that's, uh, then you're going to have some holes in, in your team. And I think the charter commission is no different in that regard. Yeah. I, and the ideological diversity point is important because one of the things that shocked me, it didn't shock me. I'm just saying that for effect, but <laughs> the, the strong mayor amendment that should shock other people who don't follow this stuff. Strong mayor amendment was put forward and put on the ballot unanimously by the charter commission. And that was the most closely contested, basically 50, 50 item on the ballot was the strong mayor thing. And it won. But the fact that of the 15 members on the charter commission, nobody spoke up to say, Hey, maybe this is a bad idea. Maybe I don't want a strong executive. Maybe I like the idea of the city council having some policy control over over the departments and, and directing them. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, you know, one of the things that, especially when you talk about, you know, lacking in diversity, um, especially when, you know, you look at, when you look for certain qualifications or credentials or things like that, oftentimes what that means is, um, as you mentioned, you're cutting out people under a certain age or you're, limiting the applicant pool from different parts of the city, um, you know, where that can cause a barrier for ethnic diversity, um, racial diversity, and things like that, um, because it will naturally limit people um, who have no um, access to, you know, higher education, generational wealth, and things like that. The meetings begin at 4 p.m., during the workday, which is it's kind of true of a lot of the city's boards and the commissions, but that's a kind of a limiting factor. I want to go through what what are our top moments. I don't think we can do a top ten. What what are our fondest or least fond memories of the Charter Commission to demonstrate to listeners how important this body is? I mentioned the unanimity in putting forward a restructuring of our city's government towards a strong mayor system. Josh, do you have any favorite moments and don't take them all. I know you're you're very smart. You pay attention. Probably pay more attention than Jason. And I don't want you to steal all the top moments from from Jason because Jason's going to go last. So I picked out two, um, and I chose two where there actually was some differences in opinion on the Charter Commission. Um, so I think that's important to show as well. Um, we, we often think of them as a monolithic body, but that's not quite the case. And that also means that there is more opportunity to change the decisions of the Charter Commission. Um, if a decision was potentially close, then changing out only a few people could mean that could go differently at a different time. Um, so the two I have are uh, probably the most infamous decision of the Charter Commission um, is when it uh, pocket vetoed um, the uh, 2020 um, proposed uh, Department of Public Safety Amendment from the City Council. Um, so the Charter Commission can't outright reject an amendment by the City Council. They can only make recommendations on it. Um, but what, because they have a certain uh, period of time, um, up to 150 days under the City Charter to or under state law to review amendments to the Charter from the Council, um, if they extend their review past the statutory deadline to place ballot questions, uh, place ballot questions on the ballot, that has the effect of of killing the amendment. So that's what happened with with that amendment. And the and the um, reason the calendar came into play like that, George Floyd was killed at the end yeah. of May, 
And if the Charter Commission, the way the Charter Commission's calendar works in terms of timing with the ballot, uh, if you try to do something about public safety starting in May, it just naturally allows the Charter Commission to, if they use all their time, push it past the election. And so and no one really had control over George, when George Floyd would be murdered by MPD, aside from like MPD and uh, maybe the, the mayor and the chief and past mayors and chiefs. But that that's how that happened. What's what's your second one? Um, and I just wanted to mention, so that one was a was a 10-5 vote. Um, so though ultimately the commission members at the time were all opposed to the substance of the amendment, there were some who felt notwithstanding their own views that people should still have the right to, to vote on it. Um, but that was not the prevailing view in the commission. Which demonstrates that they were, I think the the underlying argument there was whether the charter commission is a policy making body or simply like we're checking under the hood to make sure this fits all our standards for what a charter amendment should be. We're not making judgments on on the underlying policy implications. And I think many of the members of the Charter Commission were making policy judgments in terms of what they do and do not like, and that's why they delayed. I, I think that's accurate. Yeah. Um, and then the second one I had, so another one that was a close vote. So this is uh, gets a little intricate. Um, so with the rent stabilization amendments from the uh, the city council, they were pretty much all on the same page that they did not like the one that permitted um, citizen petitions for rent stabilization amendments. And that one ended up never going on the ballot. Um, but the other one um, that allowed for the council um, to, to draft amendments the Charter Commission proposed um, kind of a watered-down substitute, um, but that ended up being only an 8-6 vote. Um, from what I could tell from watching the, the work group uh, meeting for that, it appeared that the reason they voted against it was that those members preferred an even more watered-down substitute um, that had been um, proposed by Commissioner Perry, um, which would have... Um, in addition to the other uh, changes that the Charter Commission was proposing, would have also involved requiring a vote of a majority of all voters in the election um, for the adoption of rent stabilization ballot questions, uh, similar to how state constitutional amendments work. Um, the, the majority of the Charter Commission did not agree with that change, but it was a fairly slim majority. And so we're we're touching government structure. We're touching police and public safety. We're touching uh, housing with the rent control thing. This is you can see how the Charter Commission touches a lot of bread and butter public policy issues in the city, and it's very important. You should apply. Do we know what the address is? How do we direct people? This is something I didn't prepare for. How do we direct people to the application on a podcast? What's the website? Okay, we're we're going to direct it, direct you to the episode description to find the link to go apply to the Charter Commission. Again, don't think you have to have a lot of credentials. Just be a civic-minded adult, a resident of Minneapolis. That's all you need. Don't be intimidated by people with uh, lots of diplomas. Well, Jason, we've used up all the good stories. <laughs> Dig deep and find us a compelling Charter Commission anecdote. Um, I'm going to go actually very recent. Um given that technically uh, one of the charter commissioners uh, terms expired at the beginning of this month. Um, however, due to um, the judge who makes the appointments deciding to um, try to rebalance when um, the appointments are made, Several of the um, terms have been adjusted, um, so the so uh, people who are applying for these currently open positions will find that their um, tenure will be retroactive. So they're actually not going to serve the entire amount, and there was nothing um, really announced about that in advance. It just sort of came up this month um, after one commissioner yeah. had already 
one commissioner's term had already expired. It goes to show there's some things about the Charter Commission that are very ad hoc, and this judge just does whatever the hell he wants to do. Is is the chief judge subject to like a re-election? I know we have judges on the ballot. Is that the case? Indirectly. Um, so the uh, the district court judges are are originally appointed by the governor, and then they are elected. Um, although those elections are not generally contested. Um, and then the chief judge is elected by the district court judges. So while we technically have some very loosely defined democratic accountability, the, the chief judge is, for all intents and purposes, an appointed position. They become a judge by being appointed. And I think, how do they become chief judge? Is that something the other judges get get uh, together and decide amongst themselves? How's the that's, chief judge? That's like? correct. The yeah. district court judges elect from amongst themselves uh, the chief judge. That's literally so what, what Josh just said. Oh, well, I have, I've, well, as a listening <laughs> is not my top skill as a podcast host. <laughs> Thank you for calling me out on it. I, my uh, pleasure, John. My pleasure. Okay. And so as I was saying, there's a very limited democratic accountability. A lot of the power that the Charter Commission has comes from like, it's, a, it's defined in state law and the chief, the judge who makes these appointments is appointed by the governor. It's like, when do the people of Minneapolis get a say? You know, when they get a say is during application season when everyone should flood the judge with applications. That's when we get a say. You can't show up crying six months or a year from now when they do do something else that makes you mad if you don't send in an application and give this judge, put some pressure on the judge. He will notice how many applications have come in and he'll think, have I done something wrong? I, at least that's my hope. He will do some introspection and think, have I done something wrong? Should I change the way uh, this this body receives appointments? That was a very good example, Jason. I want to commend you on that. I think it was that's a very important thing to note, how ad hoc and unaccountable the Charter Commission is. You could just change term lengths and decide, well, this next batch is going to be retroactive terms. I kind of like the the city council version of how we uh, decide policy for cities. Like, you know what you're, you get a vote. First of all, you know, when the terms are, you know, who the people are. I prefer elections. It's true. You are a big fan of democracy. Yeah. And, and I will say this transition does, uh, certainly they won't be elected, but it does standardize the terms. Um, it is a bit of a messy process to get there, um, because of, uh, as I understand it, some judges in the nineties screwed up and appointed people to two year terms. Um, and now they kind of have to, to fix things. Um, but once the transition is completed, eventually they will all be four year terms and there will be essentially one third of the charter commission will be up each year, uh, for the first three years of each four year period. And then the fourth year, there won't be any, and then that cycle will repeat. I think you're right that the the reforms here are good and well-intended, but I think it demonstrates maybe just how this body has been flying under the radar. People have been doing whatever the hell they want just on a whim, and no one has noticed because nobody before the last two years knew this body existed aside from the people who are applying. Wasn't there an anecdote about uh, the judge in 20, like 10 years ago was said something and this is if anyone guesses what i'm talking about congratulations because this is such a vaguely described uh anecdote i I know what you're talking about okay i knew josh would know (laughs) (laughs) probably because you heard it from josh in the first place some kind of controversy i can't wait till josh pulls it up i'm gonna look so brilliant i'm working on it (laughs) um so I guess one thing that we should note here, uh, something that I've been asked a few times via Twitter is, um, you know, why can't we just get rid of the Charter Committee or Charter Commission? State uh, law. It is indeed a state law um, because Minneapolis is a charter city. It is required to have a charter commission. Um, so people have brought up the possibility of like, well, what if we, the charter commission were to vote itself out um which my understanding of that process after doing some 
research was that uh, once we got rid of the charter commission, we would also be throwing out the city charter and the city would become a statutory city rather than a um, charter city, which would completely change the structure of government in Minneapolis. Okay, Jason, I didn't listen to anything you said just now. I assume it was good, but I'm going to read from the Star Tribune article that Josh brought up. It says, here's the, the judge in 2010, the appointing judge, different from the appointing judge we have now. I get a bunch of applications, no letters of support, no explanation of whether someone has been good or bad charter commission member. He also said he questions whether having one judge make the appointments is the best way. Even the judges that do these appointments are flying blind, don't know what's going on, and they probably don't get all that many applications. So it's like if you apply, you got a, you got a good shot of winning the Charter Commission lottery. So just send in those applications available in the episode description. We'll link you right to it. And w- those applications open March 4th, right? And it runs for 30 days? Correct. Yep. So you're listening to this episode uh, probably the week of the 21st. You still have about 10 days to get your application in. Yes. Josh, have you filled out your application? Uh, I submitted my application on uh, the, the first day they were available. Oh, that would be exciting. I, is it is it ethical to, for us to be 28 minutes into an episode on Charter Commission applications for you not to have revealed that you yourself have applied? I think I did disclose it on a previous uh, episode, but but yes, okay. you're right. I will I will disclose again. Uh, I am uh, applying to be in the Charter Commission. We'll see what happens with that. Okay. Well, you have my endorsement as the official parliamentarian of Wedge Live. You're you're basically a lawyer in my book. I I am not a lawyer. No, in in my book, which is not the official okay. book. Just to I, be clear, I am not a lawyer. Nothing I say on this podcast is legal advice. I don't know if people realize this, but I gave a very poor description of something that happened 10 years ago when Josh is in 30 seconds. He has the link to the article showing us what it was. You'd think of fine charter commissioner. Think of all the links you could drop into the chat at the charter commission meeting. Just yeah. Like the drop of a hat. Yeah. You would, you would definitely be able to correct a lot of people. I'm sure um, you'd be able to cut through a lot of the, uh, bloviating that goes on a lot of the uh mindless opinion spewing you'd be right there to to get people back on track and keep the facts the facts yes and we've talked about earlier how i think josh mentioned there's some room for persuasion there have been some close votes i think what the commission is lacking is leadership from a different political uh perspective there there is no leadership for that. The lawyers, the older white lawyers, as I call them, are winning the day. People are looking to them as the experts and deciding to go with them because there's no one to stand up and say, hey, there's there's another way of looking at this. And so you shouldn't shouldn't see it as like there's unanimity on the Charter Commission. There's some room for to get three or four people on even who are good. A couple of them are leaders who can speak eloquently to a topic and change some minds. I think this isn't the U S Senate. We don't have political parties. I think there's room for persuasion. So again, everyone follow the link that's in the show description and apply. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, I, I feel like as a, a long time, um, as a person who has been interested in politics for a long time, but also, also often felt like due to, ethnicity or economic class or things like that, that I, you know, I'm, I'm not one of the people who's allowed to participate in that level. Um, you know, after watching some charter commission meetings and uh, city council meetings and watching our mayor speak and things like that, one of the things that I want to tell people is, you know, there's no magic set of qualifications just because someone has a JD doesn't make them more qualified to interpret the city charter. It doesn't make somebody a better choice than you. Um, As long as you are concerned about the city and you want to make sure that, you know, this is a government that functions for everybody, I think you should definitely apply. I will be uh, applying myself after this episode. Oh, really? I will. Hmm. That's my pledge to you, John. 
I've had white people tweet at me who've said, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to apply. Leave it, leave it for someone, leave it for a person of color. I am just, I'm a white guy. I'm a white woman. I'm a white woman who's a lawyer. I shouldn't apply. And I think maybe that's shooting ourselves in the foot because there are 11 open positions, seven of them open right now. But we need to flood this judge with applications. Everyone apply. Okay, leave it to the judge to make these decisions about uh, diversity because the, the risk is if we start counting people out and leaving these these spots for others, eh, maybe we, we just leave this judge some room to appoint all the same people. I, I want a flood of applications. Jason, what do you think about that? I think that that is a very important thing. I think um, in terms of civic engagement, it's really important to show uh, you know, this is often an accusation that gets thrown at young people, particularly, is, you know, well, you're not involved, you don't, you don't put your time into it, you don't put any skin in the game. Um, and I think this is something that, you know, it, it probably seems daunting to a lot of people, but it is something that you can use to enter into um, city government and to help make some of those changes. And I also want to point out that it's not just, you know, the, the radical leftist kooks over at Wedge Live who are planning on applying. There are also people from the uptown crime groups, uh, from, you know, the police scanner, uh, really crime Twitter accounts that are planning on applying. So even if all you're doing is helping crowd some of that out, and, you know, try to focus on getting people in who are actually concerned about equal and fair representation, not just maintaining status quo or being a regressive force. Um, you're doing a positive thing by applying. When I said Minneapolis doesn't have political parties or there are no political parties on the Charter Commission, I lied. It's actually uh, Facebook crime pages, people who are on the Facebook crime pages and people who are on Twitter. Those are the two political parties in Minneapolis. <laughs> and we we want to uh, Twitter. We need Twitter to show up and send in their applications because, as Jason said, Uptown Crime is trying to take over the Charter Commission. Be very afraid. Not really. And they've already had their handhold there. Like there, it's not that they have to take over. They've they actually yeah. have several of the the positions. I don't want to overstate it, but it was alarming to me. Slightly alarming to see like. Jana Mecki and uh, who's the other one? Jill Garcia over there on Uptown Crime and the replies. Like I don't even remember what they said, but just the fact that they were there participating in that gross cesspool. I was like, oh, I thought you had advanced degrees. Here you are on Uptown <laughs> Crime. What are you doing? <laughs> I also want to point out that I am not related to Jill Garcia. There's Jay Garcia. There's two different Jay Garcias in Minneapolis, not related. Do we have anything else to add? I feel like we're 35 minutes in. We've covered a lot of ground. We've been very efficient. And now I need to drag it out an extra hour. And I need to find a way to do it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really need to do that, but we must have something else to talk about. We could, we could go into, if we're done with the Charter Commission, we could go into plugging Josh's uh, Google Docs journalism, as I like to refer to it. <laughs> um, well, we should also plug Josh's... Uh informational tour about the oh, charter that's true. commission I, I have some questions about that josh you're doing an informational uh tour a recruitment drive can we refer to it as a recruitment drive i think so um yeah uh so i am working with some other people um uh katie blanchard helped organize it and the other presenters are uh amity foster and erica mauter um serve on Click, uh, the Capital Long Range Improvement Committee. Um, so they kind of talk about the experience of a actually applying for and serving on um, a large city committee um, and provide some advice in that regard. Um, and then I kind of give a presentation on um, the Charter Commission in particular based on, on the research I've done in the commission and the, what I've observed from, from watching too many uh, Charter Commission meetings. Has there um, been decent turnout at these events? They're happening online, right? Yeah, so I think we had uh, 12, probably 12, 15 people at the first one, um, mm -hmm. and then we have the second one coming up 
uh, on Monday night. Um, so we'll see how many people show up to, to that one as well. We've, we've been getting a lot of interest in it, um, frankly, more than I expected from presentations about the Charter Commission. So we were pleasantly surprised. Yeah, I've heard some things, too, that make me think there will be a lot of applications sent in. And that should not be a cue to listeners that they should hold off and not send their application in. Throw, throw yours on the pile, too. We need a flood of applications. Link in the episode <laughs> description. Have you heard any, uh, have you gotten any interesting feedback that's made you think a little? Like people asking interesting questions, uh, interesting concerns that had not occurred to you at these sessions? People asked a lot about what are the qualities that the judge is looking for? And um, unfortunately, the answer is we, we don't know. We can't. It's just a um, guy. We don't know <laughs> like, what. Get in the mind of this for. judge. Um, we can kind of give our best guesses based on what the application says and based on, to some extent, the background of previous members. Um, but I, I, the caution I would give with that is. Um, this this commission was not really in the public eye prior to July of 2020, so um, these people might be on there because they right. they may have been the only people who applied. Um, I somebody who's on the redistricting group uh, told me that the there weren't that many applications sent in, and that's like a subgroup of the charter commission the membership is decided by the charter commission but not many apply people applied and basically you had a really good shot of getting on the redistricting group just by sending in an application and some people didn't even show up for the interview process i heard there were actually about 30 applications for the redistricting okay, group but I, I did hear that some people who were picked for an interview did not show up yeah and so at the end of the day if they how many people got put on that group nine Nine. So nine out of 20 ish people. Yeah. It's still, still a decent shot for sure. Yeah. By bringing absolutely no qualifications at all. And qualifications is a, I think a very broad category for something like this. It's like, uh, maybe you've been involved in your community in a non-professional way. Don't think of qualifications as I've been a lawyer or I, uh, had this particular job title. It's like, have you been involved in the community? Have you shown your worth in other ways uh, when you're, because honestly, I have no qualifications, but I think I'm very qualified uh, in non-traditional ways. Although I don't think I'm applying. I don't think that would be appropriate. I tried once to do the whole neighborhood board thing, and that ended very disastrously through no, no fault of my own. That was a bad experience for me. And I think it was because I tried to keep tweeting while doing the neighborhood board thing. Turns out there was a deranged person who didn't like that. But I won't get into the details. Save that for uh, a a special panel at the Summer's Wedge Fest. Yeah. Let's talk about your uh, both the both of you your experiences on neighborhood boards. Jason, I'll go to you first. You you are on your VP of the Wedge. That's true. Or the Lowry Hill East Neighborhood Association. I like to keep it distinct from the wedge because the wedge is a neighborhood and the neighborhood association is a group of busybodies plus Jason Garcia <laughs> as VP. You, you told me a story yesterday. We probably can't repeat it on the podcast, but I wish I had been listening. It sounded awful. Yeah. Can you say anything about that? Um, no, I'm not. I'm not going to say anything <laughs> about it at this point. It was a public meeting, though. You can't recount what happened at a public meeting. Um, I can, but um, I don't think that I'm able to speak about it in a, a way that um, would make anybody involved look very good. Um, it has nothing oh. to do with the business of the wedge. It has nothing to do with any sort of politics or anything of any consequence. Um, so it would just come off as me being petty. Yeah, and while you know, I appreciate that that is a big part of what you bring to the show, John. That's not what I what I feel is is my my calling here today. Can I say it was? Have I revealed too much? Can I say that much? Uh, you, well, I already did. 
can't can't take it back. I can't edit that out of the show. Okay. Well, if you have no interesting, do you have any interesting stories you can tell about your experience on a neighborhood board? Because as we said earlier, this is kind of related to the Charter Commission because it's the same kind of people who get on. Busy bodies. Yeah. Um, you know, I I was elected to the um, Lena board in November. Um, there were three open seats and three applications. Ooh. So all of us who applied at that time were elected. Um, so I've been, uh, that same night I was nominated and, uh, elected <laughs> as the, the board vice president, um, yeah, which has been a pretty that easy. Yep. It, it's been a pretty good, um, experience. You know, I, I've had the pleasure of running one meeting, um, so far, uh, we have our, um, annual meeting coming up in April, April 20th, um, which is a Wednesday and I will, uh, I will be sending you food so that you can attend John. Uh, yeah, I've been mourning, I've been mourning the loss of free food at annual meetings. Cause I don't see why anyone would show up to a zoom annual meeting. I might show up to a, an in-person annual meeting for the food. And even then it would still be painful, but. I see no attraction for the Zoom annual meeting unless there's like a controversial topic where you're like, we must elect good board members to make a decision on this controversial topic coming up. Well, we we should always be working to elect good board members. And there will be, I believe, four uh, seats up for election or no, there are six, uh, I believe, seats that will be elected at this this annual meeting. Do we know of any good candidates? I have not heard um, who, if anyone has applied yet. Um, I also haven't heard that any of the, the existing board members um, will be running or not. I assume some of them will be, but nobody has really said anything. And you can self-nominate at that meeting. So um, it's not that you have to be nominated in advance or anything like that and um so you know that's been an interesting process obviously there have been some contentious meetings with um not only the entire board but also with the um the committee that met to discuss the um hennepin avenue plan Mm -hmm. so you know it's interesting to see who shows up only for things like that um me yes you and and many people that you would probably describe as the polar opposite of you yeah but but those are the we have in common is that we're terrible petty human beings yes who who (laughs) only selfish we don't care about anything else (laughs) but what we care about and we only show up to those meetings exactly um however i do want to point out that you know lena outside of just the board meetings has a very active and engaged population. Um, there's the Lena volunteer network. Um, you know, we have people who are providing food for people in need. Um, we have people who have, um, given their time over the winter to, um, go out and shovel, um, particularly around 26th street and, um, Ella Baker to make sure that the sidewalks are passable and safe for children and things like that. Um, so, you know, you can get involved in a lot of different ways, but the way that a lot of people find out about those things are at the board meetings. Um, and, you know, I, I would say I'm not especially a busybody. Josh is definitely more of a busybody than I am. Um, oh, Jason, I think you're more of a busybody than Josh. I, Josh is just Josh a civic out, minded, Josh civic minded guy who pays attention to stuff. He's not a busybody. He's not trying to force his worldview on anyone else. He Josh is out there publishing pieces in Southwest Voices. He's holding listening tours about the Charter Commission. He's Get, getting information to the people. Look at you. Look at the yeah the propaganda I'm sure you that have that up keeps on the wall him very behind busy. you. The the controversial statements you have up on the wall behind you. I'm sure the the Midwest Legal Center Center would like to sue you over the Black Lives Matter poster and say you're not giving giving uh, airing to alternative points of view. Yeah, as as somebody who was uh, 
dragged to court by um, someone who was in the newspaper as an abuser of young women last summer. Did you did you get dragged into court? I did. Oh, I'm um, sorry. That's okay, but after having gone through that, I'm I would say that I'm not uh, especially concerned about things like that at this point in my life. I I was once forced to initiate a legal battle, and I can say that there is one at least one thing that lawyers are good for, especially when they offer to represent you for free. It is fighting <laughs> off a, a malicious theft of your intellectual property from one time elected official Carol Becker. Lawyers are good for that. I'm not I'm not trying to say that we have no use for lawyers in this world. I will say that at least one lawyer out there was very good for accepting an exorbitant amount of money from Eric Malmberg, formerly of The Current, uh, for trying to get me to take down tweets re- uh, referencing him, even though he had already been named and had many news articles written about him and... Uh, the stories that women were telling about his abuse of them when particularly when they were underage. Yeah. And the only thing a lawsuit does, if you're suing people over tweets, you're just bringing attention to the tweets that you don't like, I think. Yeah. Right. I mean, I don't know that he even did that. I think that he just accomplished spending a bunch of his own money um, to try to make me take them down and ultimately failed. Well, going back to your original anecdote about the neighborhood association, I think, I think it proves that, Three three applicants for three positions. You've you've got a good shot. Just send in as many applications to the Charter Commission. They've got seven openings now, four coming up later. Keep sending in those applications. The link is in the episode description. The other four will be open in or will be uh, available to apply for in June. Is that correct? I, I don't think we've been given a specific date yet. Um later Und- an undetermined later time we don't have to worry about that too much you can be aware of it send in your applications now and send in your applications potentially later too josh you are with the are you still with the kingfield neighborhood association is that what yep, it's called? i'm a member of the kingfield neighborhood association board are you are you vp of kingfield no uh, i am okay. not i do not hold an officer position okay do you have any fun stories interesting stories about your neighborhood involvement are you willing to tell a controversial story uh i I mean i i actually think the the kingfield board is doing a great job um i uh think we we do a lot of good work in the community um i have found that um I was pleasantly surprised when I got on the Kingfield neighborhood board. Um, I think it it is a a lot of good people on there. I think so. That's been my, my outside impression. I've never been to a Kingfield neighborhood association meeting, but uh, for example, the 2040 plan, they were one of the few groups that like affirmatively supported the Minneapolis 2040 plan. They were among the groups supporting uh, the public safety charter amendment. I think right uh yes we we did um pass resolutions um supporting the public safety and rent stabilization charter amendments and opposing the strong mayor charter amendment kingfield is a hotbed of just far left wackadoos supporting a positive change in the world i commend you kingfield neighborhood if i couldn't live in the wedge i would move to kingfield i have no qualms about kingfield whatsoever 100% behind Kingfield. Thank you for existing. I believe Kingfield was also the second highest concentration of uh, people who voted for Kanye West for president. In uh, Really? Yes. Loring Park was number one for sure, and I believe Kingfield was number two. Well, that's odd. What was it, like three people? I'll have to look into that. I can't can't (laughs) confirm that. (laughs) Josh is not accepting this as the truth. (laughs) He will have to look it up. It it it's true. It wouldn't take very many people yeah, for it that wasn't. to be true. They, so I think Lowry this is not Hill a lie wouldn't. with statistics by Jason Garcia. You're lying with statistics. Your response? I have learned to just let most of your nonsense flow over me and around me. Okay. By saying the second highest concentration of a thing that was basically zero, you're not communicating the truth. You're trying to mislead with statistics. I mean, it's still the truth. 
t- technically true, but also highly <laughs> no, misleading. No, th- there's giving, no giving the impression that, there. Giving the impression that Kanye West had any significant support at all is very dishonest, I would say. I never said it was significant. Uh, by saying the second highest concentration, there's some implied significance there. Uh, it's just an interesting fact about a neighborhood, John. You're you you're always that? out here trying to make it sound like people are throwing accusations. I think and because you yourself are a mudslinging yellow journalist, you assume that everybody else is as well. A month a month from now, you're going to have QAnon posters on your wall. You're going down a deep dark hole, Jason. Stop watching YouTube. The only thing I watch on YouTube is the uh, Wedge Live podcast. So that's if, that's right. And one if, day you're going to get stop- a recommendation for something even worse, and you're gonna you're gonna go into a tailspin, and we'll have to have an intervention. I look forward to that intervention. What kind of videos do you get recommended after watching the Wedge Live podcast? Usually, like city council meetings and things like that. Okay, that makes sense. Just ima- imagine what it would happen if you started watching city council meetings, and then you'd get a different recommendation. Yeah, sometimes I consider watching them on YouTube instead of the uh, City Council TV site, but then I think that would just uh, mess up my my algorithm even more. YouTube is so much better, and this might be helpful to you, Josh, or though, although you might already know this, you can bring up a transcript of YouTube yep. videos, an automated transcript, and search it in your browser. Mm-hmm. So. Yep. No more like, when did this this thing happen in the meeting? Just search the word, gives you the timestamp, scroll over to it. It's a, you hit, I think you hit the three little dots or something on YouTube and it brings up the transcript. Then you do find in your browser. And this is a tip for anyone who's struggled to, to get through 40 minutes, 55 minutes at this point episode. We're giving you a tip that can make your YouTube watching of city council meetings far less painful. Because you can skip to the parts of the meeting that mention the word that you want to find. Okay. I don't know what my point was there, but I thought it was interesting since we were talking about YouTube. Josh, can we talk about your Google Docs journalism? I'm going to flash your uh, Twitter handle on the screen on YouTube, and hopefully I remember to insert it in uh, in the show description. What, what is it again? It's Josh something or other. Uh, at Josh Martin MPLS. And you're kind of like a low rent wedge live, if I can use that phrase. <laughs> I, I would be honored to, to be described as a low rent wedge live. Uh, so you watch city meetings and you tweet out uh, interesting details. And you also post things to Google Docs that are interesting. And people can find them linked from your Twitter, your Twitter page and your tweets. Uh, some are about the Charter Commission. Do you have others? Yeah, I actually have pinned to um, the the top of my um, Twitter profile a, a directory which goes to all, to all the different documents I have. <laughs> you um, have a Google Doc directory. I, to I have your a other Google, Google Doc Google of Google Docs. Docs. Yeah, yeah. Wow, somebody needs a blog spot. I think some. I <laughs> you know I I have it. It has occurred to me at points that I should probably at some point make uh, something approaching a real website. Uh, I have not, have not gotten around to it. You seem like someone would, who would have an easy time making a website. Uh, yeah. Is that true or is that a mis- misimpression that I have? I, no, I, I, it's accurate. I have some computer skills. Okay. So it's um, kind of, you're kind of, you're doing this ironically, right? It's like, uh, <laughs> here's all my stuff posted to Google Docs. You're doing it's, it it's, to be cool. It, you're too it, cool it, to do your own website. It's just laziness. I have not, I've just have not uh, mustered the energy to, to get around to making. A, a wow. Website. Your directory is super long. Yeah. It's because you're too busy watching all of these meetings and taking incredible notes. I should just well, turn over wedgelive.com to you. Cause I hardly post anything to my actual website anymore. I've got so much other stuff going on. I don't post anything to the website. Um, so yeah, so some of these are charter related. Um, I, I think particularly related to the charter commission. There's one where I just give an explanation of the uh, charter and charter commission, what that is. I call that Minneapolis Charter 101. Um, there's one document where I, I track the status of different um, charter amendments that are working their way through the process. Um, there's a new spreadsheet on the charter commission members. Um, I had a lot of stuff going on with redistricting while that was going on. Um, uh, 
You've got yeah, one on the mayoral work on groups. Mayoral work groups. Yeah, sometimes I'll just see people like kind of post things on on Twitter, and I'm like, oh, I could look into that. Um, so there was one with the mayoral work groups where um, I looked through all the different members of those and tried to find uh, to the best of my ability contact information for them. For a lot of them, I just like linked to their LinkedIn profile because that was the best I could do. Right. Um, I, this is not not very democratic the way these work groups have been set up there. I. I tend to think of them as uh, ways for Jacob Fry to paper over his his failures, because we just had a story about uh, the police. Is it the Police Conduct Oversight Commission, or is that the different one? Office of Police Conduct Review. Which one is it? Where the it, chair resigned? Police Conduct was, Oversight Commission. Yep, Abigail talking Sarah about how they've been neglected. Uh, they had struggled through times when they hadn't had enough members appointed to achieve quorum and hold meetings. We already have boards and commissions that you could use for these things, but Jacob Fry had to create something, some new, not quite official thing where Josh Martin has to search the internet to find who they are and how to contact them. And who don't have any sort of uh, requirement to have public meetings. They can hold their meetings in private. Yeah. Correct. Um, and it is... Uh, strange and unfortunate like i i guess i i understand if they choose not to hold all of their meetings in public as a group that is bound by the open meeting law would but i i feel like there is a reasonable compromise somewhere in between that and do absolutely everything in secret until the final report is released. Right. You could have um, something like a public hearing where people can come in and offer their opinions. Have that be your public meeting, something. But as it is, it's a group of people nobody's ever heard of uh, deciding something behind the scenes. And one day they show up and announce a report. I wonder what would have happened if, uh, if Sheila Najad had stayed on the, the public safety work group the mayor started. Would she had have had the opportunity to do like a minority report talking about how the whole thing is garbage? <laughs> well, with the, and and that work group has not released its report right. yet. Um, the only yeah. one that has released its report so far is the government structure work group. Okay, well, check out Josh's Google Docs coverage. There are so many Google Docs. Did you also do something for Southwest Voices? I have written two articles for Southwest Voices. Um, they asked me to do one piece on the redistricting process, um, which I have been covering for a while on uh, my own Twitter feed and also for documenters, um, which is local people kind of taking notes on government meetings. Um, so I, I did an article summarizing the redistricting process. And then more recently, they had me do an article about um, the, the Charter Commission openings. You know what I'm noticing? Your redistricting thing? You stole my maps. I I did, yes. I, I credit, no credit. Rich Live. I'm sorry. I, I added the extra numbers. Yep. You know how you I can tell? You did add the extra I, numbers, I, yep. <laughs> the maps I could find didn't have uh, numbers on all the districts, so I had to add uh, my own numbers, and I recognized my work. <laughs> uh, no, nowhere on this piece does it say maps courtesy of Wedge Live. Very very disappointed in you, Josh. You seem like somebody who pays attention to detail, so I can come to no other conclusion than this was an intentional ripoff. <laughs> don't worry, Josh. Yeah, what, I, what, I don't know can, what to say. I, I apologize. You can always okay. bring up how many times uh, Wedge Live has used your information or your yeah, opinions without true. crediting you. That's the comeback. I have probably <laughs> stolen from you countless times. On purpose. Jason, I, I know I mentioned to you we were going to do like a your ad goes here kind of oh, ad right. break. I don't know if you put any thought into that. I, I want to solicit a sponsor for the Wedge Live podcast, and I figure a good way to do that would be uh, to insert a fake ad or a real ad for somebody who wants to buy an ad. That's a real ad, right? You buy an ad on the podcast. Here's 60 seconds of John and Jason making the case that you should put your real estate ad, put your weight loss ad on the Wedge Live podcast, lose some weight, buy the house of your dreams, uh, any other businesses or products we should, we should try to get people to 
to put on the show? I'm sure people have many industries around the wedge. Uh, I'm sure somebody is making homemade dog treats right at this moment who would love to reach a new audience. Of Maybe you have a bar or a restaurant that's attracting uh, maybe not not the best clientele to the neighborhood, and you'd like to improve the quality of your patrons. Advertise on the Wedge Live podcast. We have so many listeners in the local area who yeah. would like to come to your bar or restaurant or l- take your weight loss supplement or uh, have you sell or yeah. show them homes to buy. If you're looking to reach people in the coveted 30 to 40 white oh no it's 18 to 34 it's 18 to 34 jason non-tattooed um the people who listen to the wedge live podcast are in that prime age where they're forming attachments to certain brands they are not yet uh firm in their brand affiliation and you can grab them while they're still malleable by inserting your ad and i promise jason and i will read the copy on that ad that's right. We're going to put our credibility on the line for your product or service right here on the Wedge Live podcast. I don't know how much I'm charging, but that's negotiable. Yeah. Just contact Debbie and Sales will make those decisions. Contact Debbie and Sales. I will email me at newsroom at wedgelive.com. I will forward it to Debbie and Sales. And we're going to sift through all the offers. And send this podcast to the next level. Your support will send this podcast to the next level. And we will increase your business. How much should we guarantee we will increase someone's business by if they advertise on the Wedge Live podcast? Uh, Easily two customers. Well, I was hoping for a percentage. Uh, We don't always get what we want, John. Okay. It's only upside. It's upside. It's a win-win situation. You put your ad and we're, we're not going to be, we're not going to be choosy. It could be a product or service that makes us look bad. We'll take it. There are certain, certain things we won't take. I can't imagine what that would be, but I am. Uh, probably Republican led, uh, candidates for office. It's true. It's true. Would we read a Don Samuels ad? Um, I, no, I think no that politics. we could. I don't want to get into politics. That will that will like <laughs> ruin the reputation of the show if we start reading political ads. We might read it, but I don't think it would uh, sound the way that Don Samuels wanted it to. Have we have we got enough material for an ad here? You think? I think so. Oh, you okay. know what else we could mention before the end of this month? Hmm. Uh, this is this month uh earlier this month is the one year anniversary of the wedge live pledge drive that brought you to the um the required patreon patrons true. to to initiate this this beautiful podcast we when is the one year anniversary i believe it was march 5th oh we missed the one year anniversary how could we have missed commemorating the one year anniversary um well I think, you know, the one year anniversary was, um, it was right after the one year anniversary of the Minneapolis meat jacking. Um, it was also, you know, this, that was around the time when we were getting really fired up to get people to apply for the charter commission. Yeah. We are, we're over a year from you breaking the 300 threshold and being honor bound to produce a, a regular podcast it's been a wild ride i don't know if i'm any good at this but it's forced me out of my comfort zone <clears throat> yeah and you've had a lot of really great guests um like josh true. martin we you've passed a lot of great information on to tens of listeners the episodes have been extremely long i had one person suggest to me in a friendly way that the episodes would be better if i cut my parts out or cut my parts down. <laughs> I don't talk that much during the episodes, I don't think. Sometimes you'll filibuster. It's true. Well, I do use my host privilege to to uh, interrupt Jason from time to time. But it's it's been a good run. Yeah, it's been great. And we're approaching 60 episodes. I forget what exact number we're on, but... 
Yeah, it's time for a clip show. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you to Josh Martin, who whose Google Docs journalism you can find on Google Docs. And thank you to Jason Garcia, who uh, is VP of the Lowry Hillis Neighborhood Association. Both of those are true. And all around great person. Oh, thank you. This has been the Wedge Life Podcast. I'm your host, John Edwards. Thank you for listening. This is a real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. We're in the wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now.